On today's episode, we are talking spirituality in your writing, so stay tuned. Welcome to the Christian Indie Writers Podcast, where we inform, encourage, and support Christian indie writers on their journey toward publication. I'm Jennifer Carl Tong, and I write historical Christian romance. I'm Christina Katane, and I write Christian fantasy. And we are down two hosts right now. You all know that our friend Rhonda Hagerman has been taking a leave of absence to deal with some few health issues that she's got going on. And so we... Uh, Appreciate your prayer, your continued prayers for her. Also, Jamie is taking a little leave of absence to um, take care of some personal things as well. And so you just got us, me and Tina. So we will. We promise to bring um, the same amount of knowledge with about half of the uh, shenanigans because without the other two, it's just not the same, right? It's not. It isn't. So good morning to Liz. She is here already. Good morning, Liz. It's funny because it shows us that we don't have anybody watching and we already have people commenting. So it's just such a lag. So, all right. Well, this is what we like to start off every episode with our what's up. And Tina, I'm going to start with you. What's up with you, my friend? Well, yesterday was the big day. The big day. Yes. We went to the campground. Ah. Set up the camper without getting divorced. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a momentous occasion when that happens without the divorce. <laughs> Science awesome. of a healthy marriage. You could survive setting up the camper. At least we didn't have to park it. Right. It was already we there. We didn't have right? to get the guy with the tractor to come repark it. Oh. Because he had it in, like it was a little off. I think the tire, there's like a hole in the ground where you put the hose for the gray water. Right. For the drain. And I mm -hmm. think. Whoops. Because they had it a little off. So we're having some technical difficulties. Uh -oh. I'm not sure if it's on my end or not. Um, it looks so we'll see how this goes, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'll try to shut some things. Yeah, let's try that because and I'll try to shut some things too. So while we're trying to figure that out, I'm going to go. I don't know if you can hear me OK or not, Tina. So we'll see how this goes. But um, my what's up is that uh, Sunday is my birthday. And normally I don't even care, except that this Sunday I am turning 50. And 50 is like one of those things that you don't think is going to bother you. And it doesn't bother me, but it just feels like, whoa, like that's halfway to a hundred. <laughs> and I don't feel like I'm that old. I don't feel like things are, you know, I don't know. I just, it just is a weird thing for me. So yeah. So that I'm just dealing with that, not having a birthday party though. I found out that my husband and our pastor were trying to connive to do one. So and we're not doing a birthday party, but we are going to get together and play some euchre with some of the leaders at the church. So that makes me happy. I don't want people coming and making a big deal about it, but I'm always up for playing euchre. If you don't know what euchre is, then you, you're not from the Midwest. <laughs> well, and the good news is that if you go down to the community, the senior center down by my house, <laughs> you can get free HB90 masks. So oh, that, you know. nice. And they have free lunch every day. Like, I don't <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tina. <laughs> Nothing like helping me out with the, how I'm feeling about turning 50. I could go to the senior center now. Great. Hey, they got some great exercise classes. Like I never been, but uh -huh. I, I was like, oh, I can go to the senior center now. Because our, our senior center over here is in the same building as the library. Mm -hmm. So I would go in the library and like, oh, I'm 50. I could go to the senior center. <laughs> but I also just go to the library. Mm. It's it's easier when because I have a husband that's older. So no matter how old I get, he's always older. He he robbed the cradle. I like to tell people. So I robbed the cradle. So I had oh. to wait a few years for my husband to catch up. He's <laughs> fifty one now, and mm -hmm. I well, you know, I'm older <laughs> than that. So. <laughs> Piper says, whoop, whoop, Jen, welcome to the club. Yeah. <laughs> Shell says, whoop, whoop, happy birthday, Jen. Liz Henderson says, euchre. Um, I can't spell. No, that's right. You spelled it right. It's, it's fun. Yes, euchre is the best. 
and that we're going to be playing with a bunch of people that that know how to play and a bunch that don't know how to play. So that's just going to be so much more fun because then it doesn't become so competitive. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. So I do not like to play euchre with my husband as his partner because he is so serious and competitive, and I am not. Well, then we need to get together and play euchre, and you can partner with Randy and your husband and I be, can, can clean the floor with us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. I don't care. <laughs> I'm just like, I, I, what I do is yeah. I'll get all excited because I have the ace, not realizing that he put Trump on it. <laughs> like, I just get overexcited. Oh. And he already took it, and I, like, put my ace on it. Which, like, the ace is useless anyway. But, or, you know. Not always. It depends. So, no, it's when I over-Trump him that he gets mad. Like, he Oh, he it, already had it, and then you and throw then I Trump put, on top. Yeah. That's funny. But I can't help it. I get so excited. I'm like, oh, I can take it. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. Uh, we have a prayer request, actually. Caleb Barnhouse says, need prayers to recover from stomach infections. Oh, we'll be praying for you, Caleb. That yeah, is the definitely. worst. Oof. I remember, yeah. especially when you're a mom. Like, for me, like, he's obviously not a mom. But with me, um, like, one kid will get sick, and you just know it's coming. It's going to hit all the kids. And who has to take care of them and clean up the messes? And then guess they who do. gets sick last? Because I... <laughs> oh, you had your kids clean up their... Like, if they didn't make if it... If they through... threw up... They had to... really? I couldn't do it. I oh. Look, I worked in the pediatrician's office, okay? Uh-huh. But there's only one body fluid that I could not handle, and that was vomit. Wow. I would vomit myself. Oh. They had this stuff. One time, this little girl threw up. Be careful. On... There's... <laughs> Let's not get too graphic. Just say it. On the scale. Mm -mm. she was standing on the scale she stepped back and threw up and it has like this felt <clears throat> where you stand and has little grooves in it mm -hmm. but there was this like almost sawdust stuff that i would sprinkle on there and then it like absorbs all the liquid and then you can sweep right. it up right i really needed to have that at my house because mm -hmm. there was what if you could buy that for your house i don't think you could then oh. my kids were small but um there but was now we have couple, Am we have Amazon. Everything's on Amazon. Yeah. Right? yeah. There was a couple times I made Amber clean up her own vomit because I just could not do it. Mm. But it wasn't a, like a bad. It was just right. like. But Aww. they still don't let me live that down. I bet. I bet. I mean, you know how kids are. Liz said my son had stomach issues and none of the rest of us caught it. Thankfully, that is good news. Piper says my husband cannot do body fluids. He will get sick. He used to pay the girls to clean up after the animals if they had issues inside. <laughs> I've always said that my mom, as a mom's job, all I deal with is, well, I hope no one is offended by this word, but poop. Like you have babies, you have to deal with that. You get animals, it's your job. Like it's, that's my job all the time. I feel like all I deal with is that. So that's. Funny. And it, I was just thinking the other day, it's so funny. Like when they're under a year old, you're all excited about the poop. Yeah. And you raise them about the poop. Like <laughs> and the burps. Like yes. the burps and the farts and the poops. You're like, oh good girl. How and then cute. they turn one and you're like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get your body drained. <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh, all right. So enough of the feces talk. We've got a good episode today. I think that it could be controversial at times, which I'm excited about. <laughs> not too, not going to lie, because I like to hear other people's opinions and I'm open to other people's opinions. But we are going to be talking today about we, we kind of touched on a little bit in our WhatsApp last week. If anybody was uh, tuned in last week for our episode, but we're, today we're going to be talking about spirituality in your writing. And before we can even get into this topic, we have to kind of touch on the topic that uh, what makes Christian fiction Christian. And recently we actually had um, a listener in our listener group. If you're not part of our Facebook listener group, you need to um, click into the um Oh, I don't think I have it in the show notes. I'll put it in the show notes afterwards um, and join our Facebook group. But and asked, you know, what, how do you know, what makes you a Christian writer kind of thing? So we're kind of touching all those topics. But specifically, let's start off with what makes Christian fiction Christian. And this is, I guess, up for debate, right? Mm -hmm. um, so let's. For I would say the blatant version of like the obvious thing that would make Christian writing is blatant scripture scripture references 
and where the plot or the character development depends heavily on biblical and spiritual influence. That would be obvious, right? That's the obvious yeah. Christian fiction. Yeah. Right. Um, what are some other ways that a fiction can be uh, labeled Christian fiction? Okay, you know? I need to ask for a little grace because one of the things I had to close was my outline. Oh, okay. And I'm trying to find it on my phone. So if I go out of order, don't get mad at me. That's okay. Um, but um, I use themes in mine. So okay. Christian themes, biblical themes like grace oh. and um, forgiveness and faith, those kind of things. Okay. Are obviously Christian. All right. So, so you are a little bit out of order, but that's okay. So you're talking about, like we said, another way that it can be is um, about using allegory. Yes. So there's different ways of doing allegory and you use themes. Okay. Yes. And also like Christian people living in their, their Christian faith. Okay, now you're skipping back up. Let's stick with allegory first before we go back up I'm to that. Sorry. Well, I'm sorry. I'm trying okay. to find the outline so that I can. Uh, that's be okay. Right. I'm highlighting it right now. I don't know if that's going to help you or not. Okay, so I'm going to take that back. We're going to go back and we're going to go in order just since you kind of brought it up already. So, Christian characters living out Christian life, whether the Bible is presented or not, correct? Yes. So, you had an example of that, of a, a book series that you had read. Right. I read it a long time ago. Um, the Mitford series. It was about, oh my gosh. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. I'm trying to turn this off. My daughter isn't answering her phone. So my son-in-law is calling me to tell me that she's not answering her phone. <laughs> <laughs> she's coming here. So anyway, um, it was about a pastor in a mm -hmm. little small town and his mm -hmm. wife and their whole adventures. And I think, I believe it was a mystery kind okay. of thing. Um, and they were just, so like they never showed it. That, I don't want to say never, but I don't remember scenes of him like in the pulpit preaching. Right. I remember him solving mysteries that are problems in the lives of the everyday people in this little town mm -hmm. as a pastor. That's what right. I remember. Okay. So like there were, obviously Christian undertones because he was a pastor and, but there was no like blatant, like right parts of I the don't plot remember there affected. being like scripture quoted. Now I'm, it was a long time ago, so I could be mm -hmm. wrong, but that I just remember it being a nice cozy little story. Okay. Um, so Piper says, I know there are people who want a come to Jesus moment or even an altar call message in the story in order for it to be called a Christian story. Agreed. I would, I agree with that, that there are people that want like that specific type of thing. Um, here's where the controversy I think is going to start is in my opinion that ha I think that having one church scene or just having like a pastor in the pulp, like a, someone who's a pastor solving mysteries, in my opinion, does not make it a Christian book. Now let the arguments begin in the, in the, um, the chat. So I read since last week, I've read four books. Like I've done about nothing else besides read. I really haven't written in the past week because I thought this was really important because I kind of was of the opinion that traditionally published Christian authors probably were mo more focused on adding elements of spirituality to their writing than independently published authors because I had been reading a lot of indie authors and seeing very little or zero. Actually, I shouldn't say very little, zero. If there's a little in there, fine. But I was seeing zero references to anything spiritual. Any like, like one book I read, they there was one scene where they're standing out church after church, just just talking. That was it. Like there are a lot of sinners that go to church. This whole book could have been out sinners, and it could have been sinful, and they still could have been outside the church, right? It wasn't. To me, it was a clean romance. Um, but it was listed not on, only under clean romance, but also under Christian romance. So I did a deeper dive and I read some traditionally published authors that are more recent. And guess what? Same thing. I discovered that there was no a zero reference. A friend of mine said, Hey, have you ever read so-and-so? And I'm like, I tried once I got bored. I'll try again. So I tried again, was a little bored. I'll be honest. I'm not going to say who it is. Cause I don't slam other authors, very famous author. You know, she's a very famous Christian romance author, but there was zero 
not even a church scene, nothing except for they were going to be forced to get married. So they mentioned like that they were going to be going to church or whatever for the marriage. That was it. Everybody in this time period had to go to the church to get married. So I'm curious as to what readers, we're, we're going to talk about what, what readers expectations too. But my argument is that one church scene does not fulfill this category, but you can openly argue with me if you would like. Well, I, I guess I would think that it, there should be some kind of redemption arc in the story. Um, and not, I mean, we could kind of have secular stories with redemption arcs, mm -hmm. but like a spiritual sort of redemption arc. And so, and like, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So let's move on to allegory. Perfect. Yes. I'm sorry. No, you'll this be sorry. That's what great. what my brain is doing. Nope, it's that, perfect. That was Christian fiction because the allegory was obvious. Like Aslan, sorry, trigger alert. Or what do you call it when you're spoiler, spoiler alert. alert? Aslan was ob obviously a type of Christ. Yes. Um, and so you could see it was an obvious um, symbolism that went directly to Christianity. And right. You could pick that up. Um, the Lord of the Rings is also a Christian author. Mm -hmm. um, but I would argue that that could fall into secular because he doesn't mention, like, it's not as obvious. It's not, but it's it. there. The it's allegory there. is for sure there. I mean, yeah, like the, the king returning evil, and yeah. yes, I mean, there's lots of, yeah. But it's not as obvious. So you mm -hmm. could, you could put it in the secular or you could, and people do. Like there's right. a lot of Lord of the Rings fans that have nothing to do with Christian that are not Christian. Right. But here's what I want to point out. We're looking at this as readers, which is fine. Right. We're, you know, but the, this really is an episode for writers. And if you want to put spirituality in your writing, right? right. So we're, we're kind of laying the groundwork to what, like a little bit of like what makes a Christian book Christian. Cause we kind of, we kind of have to have that, but we needed to understand and, and say that it is muddy. It is yeah. muddy. Um, and especially as readers, because we don't know the intent fully of the writer unless Charles Dickens is sitting right here next to me you cannot tell me for sure if Pip was an allegory for any sort of biblical character we don't know we can right. guess and we can say but we don't know unless he's sitting here with us um so but as a writer yeah. if I am looking at my writing and I say I want to put spirituality in my writing how do we do that right so one of the things that we're going to talk about too is it makes a difference. I think maybe possibly if you are traditionally published or if you are indie published, because I think there might be a difference between the gatekeepers and what readers want. Now, I my opinion has changed a bit since I read uh, four different books this week from both non non traditional and traditional published authors, and found that the ones, at least the ones I chose this week there was zero reference to anything spiritual, which was pretty shocking to me. Um, but I do think that gatekeepers, people that are at the Christian publishing houses might have a different standard than maybe even the average reader who picks up a book and might just be looking for a good book to read. And it maybe isn't as important to them that there is some sort of spiritual component to it. What do you think, Tina? Well, I know that when we did an episode a long time ago about what is Christian fiction, and I had gone mm -hmm. into some, publishing house um, places where you would submit mm -hmm. and to see what their standards were. And there used to be like you have, it has to have this, it has to have um, obvious biblical spiritual themes, Christian right. themes in the book. And so I don't, I didn't go back and recheck if that's changed. Obviously mm -hmm. if these books didn't have one any, right. Then maybe they're changing their, criteria for what they'll accept and it could be the influence of indie authors on the traditionally published um world because we are big and strong there's a lot of us out there which means we don't have the gatekeepers telling us you have to have spirituality in your writing to be a christian book it right. could also be i because this is what my original theory was is that there were clean and that again this could be genre related my opinion was that there were clean romance writers out there that just wanted to like advertise and market to everyone that might be interested. And so they threw it into Christian uh, be. romance, which is what I thought. 
until I read some traditionally ones this week that were not. So now my opinion is, I honestly don't know. I guess it kind of depends on who you are as an author and what you want. And I, um, I would rather be the, myself personally. I can't, I've tried. I tried writing something that wasn't blatant, something that I could try to like sell to Hallmark and maybe get some exposure that way. I couldn't do it. It just isn't who I am as a writer and who God has made me as a writer. Um, right. So, yeah. I think it all comes down to whether you're traditionally published or mm -hmm. you're independently published. It comes down to reader expectations and mm -hmm. what readers will accept. Right. Because if a reader, well, we'll go into Amazon and type in Christian fiction or Christian romance and read a book like the ones that you said that you read mm -hmm. and accept that, then that's fine. Right. And I think it's different for different genres. too. I, I agree. So you were saying, like you told me that Christian fantasy, if it's labeled Christian, it's going to have Christian, like Christian symbolism in it. There's going to be it something otherwise... Yeah, I mean, I haven't read any that don't. Right. That's what I'm saying. And like, you read I a lot. read Ted Decker and, um, oh my gosh, my the names are gone from my brain. But um, this present darkness, Frank Peretti, um, mm -hmm. Tosca Lee, those mm -hmm. kind of authors, and that there's always some kind of allegory or symbolism in the books that can be directly tied back to Christianity. Okay. Um, and so there might be Christian fantasy books out there that don't have that, but I just haven't read them. Right. And you mentioned readers going to Amazon uh, or Barnes and Noble, wherever, and, and typing in um, Christian romance or Christian fiction, and then just accepting whatever they get from that. I wonder if it's more, again, this is all the marketing, right? We as, as writers market and other writers are marketing too. If I finish, if if I finish reading a Karen Kingsbury and somebody is marketing to me, uh, Karen, you know, as Karen Kingsbury, like marketing to Karen Kingsbury readers, but they are just a clean romance and that gets suggested. But I find a lot of books through suggestions from Amazon. When I finish a book, they give me suggestions right afterwards, and I'll like read a like few of the you know descriptions, and then I I you know start reading. And it, often it takes a long time before you get to anything spiritual. So I will be so far in the book where I'm like realizing there isn't anything Christian about this, but I finish the book because I'm already invested in the you know the the story entirely so it's possible that it's it's that as well but i don't know like i said i read some traditional published traditionally published authors this week that were completely void of anything spiritual and they are being put out by tyndale and you know the all the other and zondervan and all the other christian yeah you know and as a christian reader myself i when i go looking for a book to read i'm not necessarily looking for a book with spiritual themes and spiritual allegory. I just want a book without no cussing and no sex on the page. Okay. And one of the ways that I can find that is either typing in Christian fiction or clean fiction in the, in the search bar. And so maybe there's just a lot of readers out there that are open to reading stuff. That's not necessarily. Um, right. Purely uh, spiritual. Right. And they just looking for something that doesn't have that, other stuff in it right and where i'm the kind of and maybe this is the only reason why my hackles are raised is because when i go looking for specifically a crit because i read clean romance too and i like sometimes i just want a fun read that's clean and um but i enjoy reading christian romance because not only is it like a fun read but it it enriches me somehow it brings me you know it it is a touch from God again, you know, like, and so when I don't get that, when I'm expecting that, I don't get that, then maybe there's a level of disappointment, which, you know, so again, maybe something to think about when we're marketing our books. If, you know, if we're a Christian writer um, that just writes secular or, you know, then that's fine. There is nothing wrong with that. Um, if that's what you're called to do, I would 100% do that. But if we are trying to tout our books as Christian books, then maybe we have to think about that. Yes, there'll be people that won't care, but there might be people there that care. And again, you don't want to get slammed in your. It's okay to have a few negative reviews, but you don't want to get slammed in all your reviews because you are lacking that. So right. just, and, just a thought. I, I didn't think about this earlier, but it would be interesting to do a comparison of biblical fiction versus Christian fiction. 
Because mm. that is a category on Amazon. And I wonder if there's biblical romance, if that's a category. There is. Yeah. Oh, so. I don't know if there's a category on Amazon, but there is. And so like bib specifically biblical fiction, which I have, we're trying to get someone on the show to talk about that, but specifically biblical fiction is set in biblical times and it is reference either like it's it takes a character actually from the Bible and fictionalizes their life or has another person that they fictionalize this, this whole person, but the world happening around them is actually something you can look up in the Bible. So, so it would be totally different because the whole thing has to be like set in the biblical world. So it would for sure. Okay. So I've seen a few that weren't, but there's probably just that authors didn't understand that. That they were called biblical fiction, but then what? Yeah, they didn't have. Oh, they're just marketing wrong. They're yeah. just trying to like put it out there. Yeah, no. If it's t truly biblical fiction, it has to. But then again, you know what? I will hold that opinion because we're trying to get someone on the show that can actually teach us about biblical fiction. So stay tuned for that. So awesome. Okay, so we've taken a long time to get to the actual like what we said this episode was going to be about, like you know how to put spirituality in your writing. So how 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 would we do that i would say it depends on the genre yeah in a big sure. way mm -hmm. because the way that i would do that as a fantasy writer is really different it can be very different than like you would probably not use the kind of symbolism that i would use in a romance right um to show spirituality like, I'm not sure that you would have a bad guy who's possessed by demons. I mean, you could, but probably not. <laughs> In a romance. Right. Yeah. But I'm also not going to have all these other, um, like, kind of, like, otherworldly spiritual things happening. Like, right. Angels I mean, and demons. And well, you can. I mean, the spirit because I believe spiritual warfare is real. But I'm talking about, like, if you were, like, going to have dragons that had a spiritual aspect. That's not going to show yeah. up in my kind of romance. Right. I, there, you know, there would be, like, fantasy, you know, fantastical romance out there and stuff. But, yeah, I agree and, with you. And even if you were going to write, like, a thriller, like, the way yeah. that you would put spirituality into, like, I don't know if anyone's ever read The Bone Man's Daughter. Mm -mm. Um, but it, it's basically a thriller about a serial killer. Mm. And it's, I think it was written by Frank Peretti or Ted Decker. So I can't, I get them mixed up sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the, the serial killer was like the evil and the, the girl trying to solve the mystery was the good. And it was very um, spiritual. Mm hmm. But that's like totally different than fantasy or like, I guess it could be fantasy ish, but they're like romance or. Um, right. Oh, I don't know. I mean, it is Ted Decker, by the way. I looked it up while you were talking. So, yeah. so for me personally, and if you're a romance writer, this would be my advice for you. For me, I use scripture as a way for God to speak to my characters. It's easy for when, you know, you're having internal dialogue when your character is having like a part of their spiritual arc and they're kind of like either at a, at a crossroads or trying to make a decision or whatever, that's still small voice. That's kind of how I present it. That's still small voice. And how do we know when it's God? Well, when it's straight up scripture, well, someone asked me once, not a writing question, but asked me once, how do you know when it's God speaking to you? And I laughed. And I said, when he says something, I don't want to hear. Like when God speaks in a way that I, that I, that I would never say to myself, or when he says something that's a hard thing to hear, that's how I often know. But with writing, it's easy for me to do it by taking scripture because we memorize scripture as children. We hear it when the pastor preaches, but sometimes it just kind of like gets tucked away. We don't think about it. And then when we need it, it kind of pops up sometimes. So so that would be a blatant use, like we talked at the very beginning of this episode, a blatant use of um, of Christianity or spirituality in your writing is to straight up use um, scripture. Um, and I always have, I you know, there's always character arcs in my book, but I always have a spiritual arc as well. Part of their struggle in their life is part of like a spiritual thing, whether it's trusting God or it's forgiving or it's um, forgiving yourself. Like I always have some sort of like spiritual arc in, and that helps to, I feel like to keep mine grounded into Christian fiction. So. Yeah. Mine definitely has that too. The spiritual arc of the main character. Mm -hmm. um, and then those are just like Ted Decker wrote a series of books about um, 
these kids that lived in a in a like a kind of world and there were these evil creatures trying to kill them and mm -hmm. there were these wise white owls that mm -hmm. advised them and there were these books that were missing that they had to find and when they got the whole set of books then the world would be cleansed basically mm -hmm. um so like that was very symbolic yeah and there was and it was not and then there were like they would find the books and there was wisdom in them mm -hmm. just like in the bible um but so yeah so you could just, like take it as blatant or as symbolic as you like but there's always i believe there has to be some kind of spiritual redemption arc in like that's my opinion right. i but if i want to read christian a christian story i want to see a redemption arc right of some kind and if you write other genres besides this there's lots of ways of doing it tina kind of hinted at it when she talked about with mystery with that pastor that and his wife doing you know and just showing the good christian morals that they would have as they you know that's one way of doing it if you write other kinds of fantasy you can use allegory um what are give me some other uh, genres i'm not thinking of right now uh, I mean, if you write nonfiction, let's just l l get, we got to put this out there. If you write nonfiction, it has to be Christian. It has to be yeah. spiritual, it has to have scripture. Or like, otherwise it's not nonfiction. We, and I would say it has to be biblically accurate. Yes. For nonfiction. There's a whole nother standard for that. Mm -hmm. Tina and I were in a writing group, not a Christian writing group, but a writing group with a woman who wrote erotica and also insisted that she also wrote Christian. And we were just like kind of dumbfounded. And then she actually approached me to see if my church would be willing to do use her curriculum for a Sunday school. And I was like, so we had a conversation, but I was trying to be polite and kind of find out it was really just spirituality and speaking to the spirits. And like, I'm like, no, <laughs> that's not, that's not, that's, Christian. that's not Christian. Like it wasn't, yeah. it was just being like, you know, kind of whatever. So that's a whole nother story. So uh, what are some other genres? Mystery. Um, oh my gosh. Science and fiction. Science fiction. For sure. You could use allegory in science fiction. You can use um, like just, I mean, there's so much, God is so much in science. Like, but I didn't think long enough about science fiction, but you could for sure use Christianity in, in that. Like when um, on Star Trek, there have been like Star Trek is not a Christian show. But there have been episodes where they've even had to scratch that by the end, they had to scratch their own heads and say, and kind of almost be like, maybe there Q. is a, yeah, yeah, Q is Q a whole. It's like a type of God. Yes, but in a negative way, he's a bad guy. So I would say he's more, yeah, so things like yeah, that. Yeah, but then like there's like these nuances to it where is he really a bad guy or does he see a bigger picture? Like I, I, I don't, I'm not a Star Trek fan, but my husband watches it. Mm-hmm. And so um, I watched it kind of passively from the same room, like being mm -hmm. in the same room. And there are times where Q seems to have a bigger wisdom than like we see things really black and white. And right. then he's like, yeah, but I see a bigger picture. There's also an episode where, so this is back to science fiction, not just getting too Star Trek-y on you, but there's an episode where they are at a planet that believes that when they die, their spirit, you know, lived on and of course everybody on the on the enterprise is like you know wackadoodle we know this isn't true and we've been all around the whatever but by the end of the, i don't remember everything that happened by the end of the episode somebody died that they knew was going to be dying um and before they pulled out of the atmosphere they were they their sensors noticed that there was an extra like they had these like star star kind of things that like energy things that bounced around in the atmosphere and there was an extra one all of a sudden yeah. And so they left there kind of like, hmm. So like, all I'm saying is like, there's ways of putting your mm -hmm. Christianity and your spiritualism into that. So, And then I have an idea about for a science fiction, Christian science fiction, where they, they use science to create a spiritual, like they capture an angel and mm -hmm. extract genetic material and, and com combine it with a human. Mm. To, like It's kind of an antichrist type figure. Gotcha. Um, so that is like fantasy and science fiction combined right yeah. there. Yeah. 
So if you have a genre that you write and we've not talked about it and you would like maybe some advice or maybe get some feedback from other writers, go to our Facebook group and uh, it's listeners of the Christian Indie Writers podcast. We're not very original when it comes to group names. We just wanted it to be obvious, right? We could have come up with a fun name, but we wanted it to be obvious and um, start a post and let's uh, see what kind of advice you can get from other, other listeners. Right. Because well. I would say we're not experts. We're just talking about what we know. Right. Exactly. Having conversations. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that about wraps it up and it takes us to our favorite time of the episode, which is the feeding of the backs. So it's feedback time here um, is a reminder of how we do this on the podcast. We submit, submit raw, fresh, unedited pieces. Um, it helps us develop a community of receiving criticism because we take turns to be utterly vulnerable. And it is, we, we spend 15 minutes before we start the podcast writing to the same prompt every week. And then we don't edit it. We don't read it again. We just share it live here. And this is what we do. And so Tina, will you share with us what this week's prompt was and what you wrote, please? Okay. We had five words, yep. um, bathroom, reform, misplace, bill and hut. And I did not use any of them. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> I just kept writing from what I wrote last week because I've been mm -hmm. thinking about it. Uh, and that's what was in my head and there was no room for anything else. Mm -hmm. So that's what came out. I would like to point out that before we started sprinting, you specifically said, I don't want to use the word bathroom. I'm probably not using it. And then we had our whole what's up was about bathroom stuff. So I just wanted to point that out. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I was thinking I was going to have her taking a bath, but then I changed my mind at the last minute. Okay. Okay. Eliana sat at the breakfast table, picking at her plate two months into her new marriage and she couldn't figure out what her ha husband actually felt. The problem was he wasn't a talker. When they were alone, he would look at her with a strange intensity in his eyes. Their time in bed was full of passion. Then he would flee as if the hounds of hell were after him. Outside of those times, he avoided any eye contact, spoke with businesslike coldness and never showed any expression. Eliana pushed her plate away, her stomach turning at the smell of it. As she rose to leave, her husband strode into the room. Mrs. Gresh and his mother followed close behind. As usual, the dower dowager duchess had a sour look on her face. Her lips were pursed and her eyes cold as steel. Son, I must speak to you. I'm very busy, mother. I only have a moment for a quick bite, then I must be off. You may speak to me while I eat. The woman glared daggers at her son's back. This is not how your father did things. He always had time to hear my counsel. I am not my father, obviously. He whirled to face her. What is it you want to say? His tone made Eliana cringe. She saw the redness of his face and the hardness of his eyes and realized he was angry. She hurried toward the door. Eliana, this concerns you, the Duchess said. Eliana reluctantly returned, moving in as close to her husband as possible, hoping he would see her as being on his side of whatever this was. Mm -hmm. It has been two months since the wedding. Don't you think it's high time your wife learned to manage your household? No, he replied. Mrs. Gresh is more than capable of handling that. She's been doing so very well for a very long time. But who will supervise her? Surely you don't expect me to do so in my elderly years. No, I do not. You are hereby relieved of that responsibility. But if not your wife, who will? It is no longer your concern. Now, if you don't mind, I will have my breakfast in peace. The Duchess stared after her son, opening her mouth as if to say something, then spun on her heel and... Three, two, one. Oh, man. I thought about finishing that sentence, but mm -hmm. I didn't know what to say. So I just... <laughs> good. The timer went off. Yeah. All right. So good. So they got married. I knew they were going to get married. And I don't know. I still still don't know if I like this guy or not. Like, I'm so intrigued by this story and I want to like him. So you so I don't know if that's good feedback for you or not. Like, but I want to like him. And I feel like he could be this like broody, like great romantic like lead. But yeah, I still don't know, especially like, you know, like if he's like so cold to his wife outside of the bedroom, then like, I don't know if I like this guy or not. Right. Like I, he's just letting his guard down. Mm -hmm, in yeah. those moments and then putting up a wall yeah but i kind of want his a little myself 
Yeah, and everything is from her perspective, and I don't know if that's your plan for the book. Um, but... I don't know if I have a plan for a book. Okay. <laughs> I'm just trying out a few different genres to see yeah. how they feel before I decide what I'm going to write next. The next time you sprint, you should sprint from his perspective. A scene oh. from his, and see if you could do go back and forth or if you just like one perspective for the story because that can be good too like i do like one perspective romances where it um it, everything is revealed through the person's actions and the things they say out loud i think that is good i too. think i kind of prefer that yeah so i don't know we'll see what happens yeah interesting um there was something else I was going to say too. Oh, and I love that like his mom is so snotty and he's already handling her. But then it also kind of worries me because the whole thing is always, I always say to, to girls, tr watch how he treats his mom because that's how he's going to treat you. So then that might make us think that he is like not going to be good to Eliana either. So mm, at the same time, maybe he's just done dealing with her. True. And you can, this is just a sprint, right? If you're yeah. actually making more out of this and you can reveal that in pieces, like instead of this might not come for like a long time in the book, like you would have little bits of it. Yeah. So, right. Yeah. Shell says so good, Tina, give me more. I agree. I want more of this book. So okay. yeah, well That's done, right. Tina. I'll do my best. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, so turn. my turn. Where'd mine go? Ah, there it is. Okay. I used two of the words. I did not use bathroom. <laughs> and we're back. Yeah. We're back in Widows of the West again. That new bridle is missing. Missing, Kate asked, turning from the stall. Are you sure Chappie didn't misplace it? Colleen shook her head, her long strawberry blonde braid waving down her back in response. No, it's not like Chappie to misplace anything. Her back was decayed as she sifted through the hanging bridles along the wall. Her braid dangled down her back, and the movement drew Cade's eye down the silky path it made down her back, all the way down to the breeches she wore, breeches that were far too tight for her soft, womanly figure. Cade grunted and turned away. He should not be looking at the widow like that. Why did she have to insist on wearing men's clothing and working beside the men? He and Chappie were perfectly able to get the work done without her curves distracting him from the task. He grabbed a saddle off the stand and headed toward the door. As he did, he saw a man dismounting and tying his horse to the porch railing. Who's that? Kate asked. Colleen turned from the bridles and came toward Cade. When she saw their visitor, she stopped, st stepped behind him. That's Bill Grayling. What's he want? I'm not sure, but it can't be good. I'll go see. She stepped around Cade, and her silhouette framed by the barn opening once again brought his mind back to her form, so beautifully displayed in those tight breeches. Oh, no, you ain't, Kate announced, stepping be between her and the barn door. Three, two, one. Mm -hmm. I got to admit, I self-added it a little bit as I was reading it out loud because I had him say, like, that he knew who the guy was. And I just took that part out because as I was writing, I'm like, no, I don't want him to know who it is. But I don't know. It's just a, nice. it's just a sprint. So. Nice. Thanks. I, uh, I'm trying to self-edit myself right now. <laughs> <laughs> Like, that's a really, how, how do I want to say this? That is a very creative and clever way of adding a little bit of heat was to it, your Christian romance. Was it too much? It wasn't too I much. I don't think so. Okay. Um, Because we all know, like, that there was heat going right. on with him. Right. That without you having to spell it out and... and you know, should say too much. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a very um, classy and cre creative and clever way to do that. Awesome. Thank um, you. And also, I want to know who stole that bridle. <laughs> I know who stole it. And I know and what's I going on. But... Like, oh, uh, somebody stole the bridle and we're going to have to deal with him. Right. Exactly. Like, so my mind is already like, okay, what are the hints? And the clues about who did it. So. Thank you. I could have kept writing this too. When the three, two, one hit, I was like, darn it. Yeah, like I had, like, I could have probably writ written for another 15 minutes easy in just this one scene because I kind of know where it's going. This Bill guy showing up, Bill, whatever I named him, um, mm -hmm. Grayling showing up. And um, that's, I, that's how I use the word Bill of our five words. I made it. Oh, yeah. yeah. I see that. Oh, I see that. <laughs> um, so I don't know if that's a cheat or not, but I did. Um, 
Like I, uh, that's going to help bring another part of the, of the story arc. Like it's I, now I have like all these pieces and this all came from the fact that my, you know, my outline was not as solid as I would like it. And that's why I was kind of struggling with this book, getting it off the ground, even though I've been writing in this, in this world for like two years, it feels like, um, but when we when we were together writing at one of those writing sprints last this last April, you and I sat down and you helped me like kind of brainstorm some things. And now it's like I know now I can see everything fitting together and how That's it's all cool. going to work. And this is a scene that even see, it seems on the surface like it's about Cade being attracted to her. But there's like two other things happening at once. And the bridal is part of it. And this Bill Grayling guy is another mm-hmm. like they're not even related. They're and I two- just know he's not a good guy. He right. Neither of these, like, neither of these things tell. happening. Yeah, and they're separate. That's the other thing too. And yeah. I think that's one of the things that, like, I from reading some of these novels, I've just been disappointed in myself personally. Is that there's just not enough going on. So one of the books I read that was by a traditionally published author was, or, well, I was a novella. As you should be honest, one of the books I read this week was a novella, and the entire novella was just about. It was it covered two days and it was all about, do you still love me? I think I still love you. Like it's been years, you know, like it was just like inside and then conversations is nothing happening. It was all just about the relationship oh, and wow. nothing else. And that like, I need more. <laughs> I guess that's why I write this way. I need more. I need things happening and I need like a mi- little bit of mystery. And yeah, yeah. So that's like, you know, when I was a teenager, I had read a couple of Harlequin romances and mm-hmm. they were just so boring to me. Yeah. And then my da- my dad bought me a correspondence course, a creative writing, short story, creative writing course. Mm-hmm. Um, and they gave you a mentor. And the mentor that they gave me was a Harlequin romance writer. Oh, wow. Like so. And so, of course, there was like this lack of respect. I was 14. <laughs> and immediately I was like, well, she writes romance like Harlequin. Mm-hmm. And then when she criticized my story idea as being unmarketable, I was mm. just like, I just quit. I was mm. like, and I feel like, okay, the idea was about an alligator who has, who like acts like a human. Okay. So they like, uh-huh. Um, he likes bean burritos and he goes to visit his um, his girlfriend Henrietta in the swamp every night after he gets a bean burrito from the, like, the guy at the cart on the side of the road. Uh-huh. And um, these guys from the Bronx Zoo come and capture Henrietta. Uh-huh. Like that was her name. And take her to the Bronx Zoo and he has to go rescue her. And she called that unmarketable. And then Madagascar came out like 10 years later. I feel like somebody stole my idea. Yeah. Changed it around. <laughs> <laughs> and made billions of dollars. Yeah, I would have totally <laughs> said that. It was like, no, it's not marketable to romance readers, but I would have said that story was completely yeah, wrong. I was like, yeah. quit. Aww. I was just discouraged and I was like, forget it. That's like, I don't care what your opinion is, but I'm not, why am I going to keep doing this if you're just going to say it's not marketable? Mm-hmm. But you know, you were talking about your sprint. I didn't even get to the idea that I had about my sprint because I want, I was trying to get to her confrontation with him. Mm. of like what what you don't think i can handle your household right and that's uh, good and then his response which is going to be really good are you going to write this Mm -hmm. probably next week oh awesome all right so i didn't get to mine either because my whole thing is going to be how are they going to get her into the house with this guy not seeing her so she she can put a dress on so like it's going to be this whole like because like the Bill Grayling thing is kind of showing up, but we don't know his like the whole connection he has to the store and the the bridal thing is just kind of like this is just dropping in right now. Um, this scene is really and truly about her trying to get into her house without in in and how Kate's going to help her. It's going to be hopefully a little funny too. So uh, yeah, I didn't get right. anywhere near it too. That sounds fun. Yeah. So awesome. awesome. All right. Well, it's time for us to start wrapping up, Tina. So it's time for our what's next. So, Tina, what is next for you this week? I really need to get this book done. Mm. And I have been blocked. And I don't know why uh, I've tried different things that I thought were going to be the answer. And it wasn't the answer. And I just don't know what the answer is. Mm. And, like, I can see some of it. And I just can't see the whole entire ending. Mm -hmm. I think that's the problem is I can't see it. Mm Mm-hmm. And so I've been trying to do some of the regular things that I do when I'm stuck, but I'm just stuck and I don't mm. know why. So 
It's only like 10,000 words that I need. Oh. So it's a little frustrating. Um, but I'm just going to keep trying some do um, some different things. I feel like we need to get together. I think if we get together and work, then it would help both of us out. The I problem is, so. the problem is, is, yeah, here's my what's next. <laughs> <laughs> right. So this weekend is shot. First of all, today, my dad is coming to pick me and my daughters up to go garage sailing. Uh, this weekend, specifically tomorrow, but in our area, there is a giant garage sale like down M15, which is it goes from Vassar, Michigan, all the way down to Clarkston, Michigan, which I'm not even sure how many miles that is. It's probably an hour at minimum of a drive. And people will get up early in the morning and drive the whole thing on that Saturday. It's always the first Saturday of May. But today, a bunch of people have already set up. So he um, he wants to go garage stealing. The funny thing is, is that's not my dad. That was always my mom. My mm. mom loved garage sailing. She loved thrifting. She loved getting furniture off the side of the road and redoing it or whatever. And so I think a lot of it's my dad missing my mom. And oh. I miss my mom too. So we're going to do this together. And I'm I'm actually really excited about it. So that's the today that's is shot. Fine. Yeah. Today's shot. Tomorrow we do Saturday church. And so tomorrow and we're going to be cleaning my house because we got to do that and then go to church. And then Sunday is good luck my, getting to church down M15. I know with the garage sales, you're going to have to go around. I think luckily we can go, we are going, we turn right out of our subdivision onto M15 to go South. And our, I don't have to, I can just keep going South. I don't have to like, cross traffic. You know what I mean? I don't have to turn left out on anything. Our, my church is on the same side of the road as I live. So we're good. Right. It, it is a drive. It's a half an hour drive, but um, Sunday's my birthday. And that day is kind of like all taken up. And then Monday, I, um, I've been working at my church. So Monday I'm busy. Tuesday, we have our meeting and I've got to do laundry because Thursday morning, Wednesday, I'm working again. Thursday morning, I am going to Olivet Nazarene University with my uh, church, with the teenagers. I'm chaperoning. And I'm gone like all the way up until like Saturday night late. And then I, uh, Sunday I'm doing laundry and Monday I leave for a leadership retreat. So um, I don't know when I'm getting any work done, but what I have to get done is I have to get um, book force, book cover, blurb. I got to get that together and I got to get it all put together so that I can get it to my last editor and be ready to publish in a couple of months. Fine. So I have two months to get that all done. And so, you know, it's a process. So I got to work on mm -hmm. that and find somehow find time to do all of that. But my son-in-law is going to, to all of it for the, for the quizzing. Oh, that's, this is not quizzing. Oh, this, this is the teenagers. The kids quizzing is actually not going to all of it. Oh, that's let's celebrate go. life. That's an, in, the quizzing's in Indianapolis. Yeah. I'm like, there's too much that's in going June. on. I'm so I know. confused. So, oh yeah. So that's another weekend that I won't be. We better look at the calendar. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, having said all of that um, and given you guys my whole sob story, um, we are taking a small hiatus from the show. It wasn't a planned hiatus. However, I have committed to things for my family and for my church that I have to do. Tina has commitments as well. So the next three weeks, the rest of May, we will not be having a podcast, which makes me sad because I will miss have, seeing everybody and doing all of our stuff. But we are not going to be here for the 12th, the 19th or the 26th. We will be returning on the 2nd um, and I will be here the 9th as well. I should be. So we should be fine after that. Um, okay. We'll have to see. So, but I would say, like, get let's get active in that group, in that Facebook group. Um, somebody try to post something every day, and we'll keep the communication open. And yes, um, if you haven't joined, go join. And please, uh, I I've had to um, message several people. I don't know, maybe more than a dozen since we started the group. You have to answer the questions in order to be accepted into the group. So there's like three questions. You have to answer them. If not, you're going to get denied. And um, I try to send people a message like, I'm sorry, you didn't answer the questions. Can you try again? Mm -hmm. um, so that we can let you in. So Because I we don't want somebody in there that's going to spam. We did have one person that we had to kick out in all of these months. Um, but yeah. we don't want someone in there that's just coming in just because they want to spam. They came across a Christian group and they want, you know. Right. So, so the questions are geared toward making sure that someone has actually listened to the podcast and knows what, like, who we are and 
things like that. So, right. Yep. You got to be fans. Cause you know, we want, we want to be semi-famous yeah, in the group. Listener Just kidding. <laughs> of the Kristen Randy writers podcast. So if somebody has even listened one time, they should be able to answer these questions. You can even Google search and answer these questions. Right. You I mean could, like, yeah. Right. Which is probably what happened with our spammer, but yeah. Anyway. All right. Well, I think that about does it unless there's yeah. anything else. We um, are so appreciative to all of our listeners and those who listen to us as a podcast. And we appreciate you guys allowing us to take some time off for do things for our family. And we're sorry. I saw a sad face in there from, I think it was from Liz. Let me look. Oh, yeah. Liz sorry, Henderson. Liz. Sorry, Liz. I, I'm sad too, but we are so glad that you guys are here and we appreciate you. And so we will see you in June. Uh, and until then, may your pen be prolific. May your deadlines be met. May all of your words honor Christ. Bye now. Bye.